I remember it like it was yesterday. July 16, 1969, 9.32 a.m. The engines to Apollo 11 blasted to life. The steam cloud rose, the rocket rose, the flame behind it, the ripples of the water coming across toward us, the noise, the roar. Absolutely, I remember every moment of it. There was not a dry eye. I'm D.P. Lyle, and this is Criminal Mischief, the Art and Science of Crime Fiction. But today, I'm going to take a departure and tell you a story. Uh, it's not doesn't have anything to do with crime fiction. It doesn't necessarily have anything to do with writing, other than it's a story. And if you glean some stuff out of this to help your storytelling, fantastic. But the anniversary of one of mankind's greatest, greatest adventures and successes is coming up and that's the 50th anniversary of the moon landing but my story with Apollo 11 did not start on July 16th of 1969 it started a long long time before that I was born and raised in Huntsville Alabama it is a interesting town in that on one hand yeah it's a sleepy southern town with pickup trucks barbecue joints and a church on every corner it's surrounded by farmland rich in cotton and soybeans and high gear and corn and you name it i hunted and fished all over with my father growing up you can literally drive five minutes from downtown and and be out in the country but it was more than that. It was an international city. And it was that because of the space program that was developed in the mid-50s when I was a child. It was Von Braun and his crew came there to build rockets. They came there to go to the moon. And the Redstone Arsenal is a large military base there just south of town and borders a long, a long segment of the Tennessee River that kind of loops down from Tennessee into Alabama and back north into Tennessee. It's kind of like a swag in the river. A lot of the TVA projects were built along there, the dams, which produced lakes where we water skied growing up. It's, um, it's, um, it, it really was an amazing place to grow up. I thought everyone had a space program in their backyard. Uh, I didn't realize that this was unique. But Marshall, uh, the Marshall Space Flight Center was developed in the mid-50s when they leased about 30% of the Redstone Arsenal. We called the whole thing growing up just the Arsenal. It was there, uh, and we just, um, we just knew it existed. Uh, it was part of the fabric of life there. All of my friends, uh, many of my friends, their fathers worked there, their mothers worked there, they were scientists. Uh, a lot of the, the, the children of the, of the German scientists that came over after World War II with von Braun, I went to school with them. So the space program was there. We knew it was there. Uh, and, and we grew up with all of this. In fact, Huntsville was known as the Rocket City. And even today, when you drive in from the airport toward the city, you pass the Space Museum. And there's rockets standing there. That's what they call the Rocket Garden. And there's all these things in, in, in space exploration and military history there. There's a museum. It's the best space museum around. I've been to the one in Houston. I've been to the one in Canaveral. This one's better. It's where the original space camp was, where kids could go learn to be astronauts. And when you drive in at night from the airport toward the city, the rockets are lit up, and it's really, really breathtaking, and it just kind of appears like a mirage as you're going down the highway. As a child, uh, like I said, we, we knew that there was something going on out there. We knew that they were building rockets. We knew they were testing rockets. In fact, everyone who grew up in Huntsville at that time can vividly remember the ground shaking. And it wasn't earthquakes and stuff like out here in California. It was just Von Braun testing another rocket. And it would shake the entire city, sometimes dramatically so, sometimes breaking windows and knocking stuff off shells. I can have memories of playing a, a little league baseball and you'd be out there on the on the field and they would stop the game while the ground shook for a couple of minutes. And invariably, everyone, the players, the coaches, the fans would turn and look to the south and sure enough, a huge steam cloud would rise and several hundred feet in the air 
and it was just another rocket booster test. Some in, in the late 50s, Russia put up Sputnik, and that was huge. That shook the nation. It shook the world. It was an incredible achievement, and it showed us that we were behind. Well, we tried to catch up with, with a couple of rockets like Vanguard and whatnot. Of course, they blew up or bounced down the runway and exploded, and it was a dismal failure. And so finally they said, well, maybe we better go ask this Von Braun guy if he can put a uh, satellite in orbit. And, of course, he said, absolutely, and they did. Uh, and then he built the rockets that put up other satellites and the Mercury program and the Gemini program and finally the Apollo program. The Apollo boosters were developed there at Marshall. And when they tested them, they had to build a special test tower. And it was, um, it was huge. It was I forget, 36, 37 floors high. I forget more on that later. Um, and when they would test those Saturn boosters, the, the, one at a time, remember they were clustered together for the rocket itself. I mean, it would literally shake the city. Those were big rockets. And they never took it, if, if I remember correctly, to over 75% of maximum power because this was a static testing. It wasn't allowed to fly. It was, it was bolted down and fired. And they would pour water in there in this big shovel, they call it, which would deflect the flames away. And uh, that was the steam cloud that we saw growing up on the smaller rockets as they were being built. Um, The whole thing progressed from that, and, and, and I followed, I used to be able to tell you every Mercury, every Gemini, every Apollo launch, the dates, what the duration was, what, who the astronauts were that were there, what they did. I used to know all that stuff because I grew up with it. I'm old now, and I forget that stuff. But we remember the tragedy of Apollo 1 when Grissom, White, and Chaffee uh, died in, in the capsule fire on the, on the launch pad. Uh, that was a tragedy, and it really almost derailed the program. Um, but remember, that was less than two years before Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. So we recovered, and we moved forward. Way back in the beginning, in the early 60s, when Kennedy said we're going to go to the moon in this decade, that was a very bold statement. And in fact, he caught a lot of flack for it because – his advisor said, you know, Mr. President, we can't pay for this. This is going to be billions and billions and billions of dollars. How are we going to do this? And so apparently the story goes that he wobbled on that a little bit, and they were even trying to figure a way out of it. But in 1962, he came to Huntsville, and he met with Von Braun. And Von Braun showed him what was going on, what could be done, how this would all work how we had to orbit, how we had to use translunar injection, how we had to go into lunar orbit, how we had to have a lander, how we had to do all of this stuff. And Kennedy realized that, you know, they got this figured out. Maybe we can do this. But then he went and saw a, a booster firing test. And years later, when I toured NASA there, we got to go up on that tower, which is something very, very, very few people do. And that's another story unto itself, and I won't bore you with that. But we were up on top of that tower, and you can see all over. You see multiple counties all up and down the Tennessee River, all over all over Marshall and the Redstone Arsenal. It's it's incredible. And this was the tower that shook the ground when, when I was a kid and, 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 and later on as they were developing the Apollo program. And when we were there on top of that, they pointed to the building and said, that's where Kennedy was when this thing was test fired. Well, Kennedy came there and watched this test firing, and he was amazed at the power that this, this engine could generate. And the story goes that he changed his mind then, that his doubts evaporated, and that he said, yes, we can do this. We have the capability of doing this. And so the program moved forward. So I grew up with the space program. I grew up knowing all about it. I grew up following it religiously. I rarely missed a launch when it was on TV. And back then, almost all of them were. Uh, it was a huge event. And then they would get scrubbed at the last minute. And you'd watch the next day. And you would wait because there was something so exciting and so wonderful about these events that it captured the world's attention. 
but nothing like Apollo 11, because this was special. We had been close to the moon. We had orbited the moon, but we had never set foot on the moon, and this was going to happen. And Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins were going to do this. Well, I was in medical school at the time, and it was a summer between my freshman and sophomore year, and I was doing cardiac research at the medical center there, which afforded me the ability to at least take time off fairly easily. And a classmate of mine had an aunt that worked for NASA and lived in Cocoa Beach, and we drove down. We drove down for the Apollo 11 launch. And I remember we left late afternoon. It's a long way to Cape Canaveral from Birmingham, Alabama. And we got in like about 2 o'clock in the morning. It was dark. It was quiet. There was nobody on the road. I mean, it really it was almost like a ghost town at that time because everybody was hunkered down for the night at that time of morning. But off in the distance, we saw this pinpoint of light. And as we got closer, we saw that those lights were illuminating the rocket. And we saw it across the water and across the flat land that's there. And we, as we got closer and closer and closer to Cocoa Beach, it became larger. It was chilling. We even stopped and got out of the car and stood on the side of the road and just stared at it like, my God, this is really going to happen. This is amazing. Well, we got to his aunt's house and, and, and crashed and got up the next day. And, you know, she had arranged a tour of NASA for us. And this was fantastic. So we actually went on the Space Center. We, we, we did all the touristy things. One of the things we did is, is we, we drove right by the rocket. We were within half a mile of it. Just drove right down the road right next to where it was. Set up to go. It might have been a little more than half a mile, but it certainly wasn't a mile. We were very close to it. And it was huge. It was massive. It was amazing. And then we went to what they call the Vertical Assembly Building, which at that time I think was the largest building in the world. I re if I remember correctly, it was 726 feet tall. But it was massive inside. There were four silos um, in each corner of the building and then a large central area. And you walk into this central area and literally you could have played a football game in there. It was that big. And each of the silos was for the construction of an Apollo rocket. And of course, the one for Apollo 11 was empty because it was out on the launch pad. Apollo 12 was looked completed. You could actually see it through the sliding doors. They had these doors that went up and down like, uh, uh, like, like um, shutters that they could move because this place developed weather inside. It was so big and it would actually rain in this place. It was probably condensation from the Florida humidity, but they always said it could rain inside the vertical assembly building. So Apollo 12 was mostly done and Apollo 13 was getting done. The famous Apollo 13. Um, so we, we saw all of the Space Center, and, and it was just an amazing, an amazing event. All right, so that evening, the launch was scheduled for the next day. The city was inundated. They say two million people showed up. I don't know. It could have been the entire population of the world was there as far as I was concerned. There were so many people. Everywhere you looked, there were campers and trucks and tents and stuff lining the coastline for miles, for literally for miles, every place was packed with people wanting to uh, witness this launch. All the, the the restaurants and motels and bars all had signs out front, you know, go go Apollo Eleven, that kind of stuff. It was it was an amazing atmosphere. The electricity in the air, you could almost taste, you could feel. It was it was a happening. It was a world event, and everyone there knew it. We um, we went for a run about uh, 9 or 10 o'clock at night, and, and we went out on the beach, and we ran for like an hour up the beach and then turned around and jogged back. And every step of the way w literally were campers and, and motorhomes and trucks and tents literally shoulder to shoulder all along the beach. 
it and like I said, we ran an hour each way. It was it was phenomenal. And these are all these people getting ready for the next day. So we came back and showered and all that and decided to go to sleep. We couldn't sleep. We were we were so amped up we couldn't sleep. So about four o'clock in the morning we had to meet the shuttle bus that were uh, his aunt had gotten us passes. Don's aunt has gotten us passes out onto the Cape to witness the launch, which was apparently a, a very precious ticket. And um, we had to meet the shuttle at six thirty to take us out on the on the on the Cape, which was three hours before launch. And so. We woke up at four. We, we couldn't sleep. Okay, we got ready. We we drove down, I remember, to a local Holiday Inn, and it was open. And we went in there and had breakfast. And a lot of the ABC News crew was in there. They had a big table there. And I remember seeing them sitting there eating breakfast, the guys you'd seen on TV. So we had breakfast and came back and got ready and caught the shuttle and went out on the Cape. That took a little while. There was a lot of traffic and stuff. But we the bus took us there, and, and they let us out on this shoreline and it sloped down to the, to the swampy water there. And then across it, you could see land again. And there was the rocket standing right there. We were six and a half miles away. I think the closest anybody was, was three and a half miles. And that's where they have that bunker where all the, 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 the scientists and everybody hunker down for the, for the launch, but nobody's right next to the rocket, obviously, for obvious reasons. Yeah, I mean, it might explode. It was chilly. It was a cold morning. I remember that. And uh, it was overcast a little bit. There were clouds, uh, like a marine layer type thing, if you will. And uh, so we had on jackets, and we were there. They had loudspeakers set up all around. There was probably... I don't know, 1,200 people there standing around. These are obviously people who had passes to get onto the Cape for the launch and all that in this particular area. And we stood around. We met a lot of people from all over. It was amazing. And and as the clock ticked, and they're sending announcements all the time, T minus one hour and counting, we're doing this, we're doing that. So we were hooked into the NASA thing. And so we were hearing all of this stuff of what was going on, you know, final loading of liquid oxygen and all these things that lead up to the launch, all the things they have to do, you know, that uh, switching over to internal power, like a couple of minutes before launch, the swinging away of the, of the, of the tower, that the astronauts had used to get into the get into the capsule and all of that, and and where they would be rescued if something happened while it was still on the launch pad, and where all the final preparations were done, and it swung away, and 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 the time is approaching, and I mean the electricity in the air just permeated your body. It was it was amazing, and then we get to the final minute, and the countdown starts, and everybody was buzzing everybody was exciting everybody was jumpy and it counts down counts down counts down and it gets to three two one and then you hear this roar and this blast and a steam cloud rises and kind of obscures the rocket for a minute and nothing happens and you're standing there waiting oh my goodness Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. And then you slowly see the nose of the rocket rise above that. And it grows slowly, painfully slow. That's what I remember most. And then it cleared the steam cloud and it started picking up speed and rising into the sky. And fortunately, by this time, there were just a very wispy, thin clouds, very few. It was 90% blue sky. And here it goes. Boom, and you watch this thing, and I mean, it's almost like you forget to breathe. It was so clear, and we could see so well that we saw it stage from the first stage to the second stage, the little puff of fire, and then the thing took off, and then it was a dot of light, and then it disappeared, and then everyone could breathe. But we hung around there while NASA was giving us, you know, the how far down range and what the speed was and, and what the altitude was and da 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 da. And we waited there uh, for however long it was, 20, 30 minutes, and it reached orbit. And it was like, okay, okay, the first part's done. The first part's done. 
we got them safely into space. And now we prep for the translunar injection and get to the moon. Um, and when everybody got back on the bus, going back, I mean, there was everybody was chattering and talking. Everybody was so amped up. It was phenomenal. But that moment, that morning, is something that is indelibly imprinted on my mind. It will never be the most amazing thing I've ever witnessed, ever. Four days later, we're back in Birmingham on uh, July 20th, and Neil Armstrong walks on the moon. And, of course, we were glued to the TV like everyone else, and we listened to that, and uh, it's amazing. It, it's just amazing. This was one of mankind's greatest feats, no question about it. And I am awed that I got to watch the takeoff. I have a pen and ink drawing done by a guy named Callie of Neil Armstrong hanging on my wall. And it's signed by Neil Armstrong, um, one of my prized possessions. Because as a kid who grew up with the space program and who witnessed the launch of Apollo 11, the space program will always be part of me. When we went back and toured, and I told you about we climbed up on that tower, Nan and I got a tour, of a, a private tour of NASA when I was doing research for a book, and that led to them inviting me back to do the ribbon cutting for CSI, the experience that came there to the Space Center, because NASA did a lot there. I met Dr. David Hathaway there, who was the um, director of the of the lunar image, I mean the uh, solar imaging program, and he's the guy that had been in the Visar system. And David appears uh, in in my first Dub Walker book, Stress Fracture, because they have to have an image in, enhanced. Dub and T. Tommy do, and uh, his his name is changed obviously for the thing, but he's acknowledged in the thing. And David was a great guy, and he really, really uh, showed us a lot and how he developed the Visar system, which is if you see a AT, a ATM camera and a car pulling away and it's blurry and they enhance the image and read the license plate. That's the system that, that David and his partner uh, uh, developed. Uh, it started from the Atlanta bombing. Again, that's another story, but they were caught in, they were brought in to enhance some uh, news footage images to try to figure out how the bomb was constructed. And they did. And that's where Visar started. But while we were there, uh, Gina Cox, who was a, uh, a liaison there, public relations liaison there, who, who arranged all this for us, she asked if we'd ever seen a shuttle launch. And we said, no, no, never have. She said, well, you're invited. We'd like to invite you down for one. So she, to make a long story short, she sent us a, a list of things. And later that year, this was like April, so that October, I think it was, they had a night launch. And she suggested that would be a good one. So we traveled down to, uh, to Canaveral. And we witnessed a night launch of the shuttle. Now, the shuttle doesn't mess around. When the engines fire up, it's gone, baby. It's like a, it's, it's like a drag racer. It's not like Apollo. But it was also exciting. But nothing like Apollo 11. And one last thing. Years later at the Maui Riders Conference, Ron Howard was there as one of the speakers. And, and, and I got a chance to chat with him for a minute. And I said, I want to thank you for something. And he said, oh, really, what? I said, you know, I grew up in Huntsville. He said, oh, yeah, we had a great time there when we were doing Apollo 11. It's a cool little town. I said, yes, it is. But what I want to do is I want to say thank you. Thank you for doing Apollo 13 straight up. Telling the story the way it happened and not making it all Hollywood. And he kind of laughed and he said, it's interesting. That's exactly what a lot of people wanted to do. He said, but. He, he, he and Tom Hanks apparently said, no, 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 no. You got to tell this story straight up. So if you haven't seen Apollo 13, it's, it was the next great step, if you will, in the space program. After Apollo 13, people seem to lose interest. Um, but uh, Apollo 13 is the one that they, they uh, we almost lost them. You know, they had damage. They barely brought them back from the moon. I mean, it was touch and go. But the movie... Hits on all the points and tells the story exactly like it is. Finally, when I was there doing the uh, CSI uh, uh, experience thing, it was doing the ribbon cutting. They had a cocktail party at uh, at the Space Museum, and they have this uh, 
huge building there that has one of the Apollo rockets suspended in the ceiling. And so you're walking under it while you're having a cocktail party. Um, and I met Edgar Mitchell. Edgar Mitchell was uh, the fourth man. No, Edgar Mitchell was the... Yeah, Edgar Mitchell was the um, sixth man to walk on the moon. There was Apollo 11, there was Apollo 12, Apollo 13, they didn't land, and he was on Apollo 14 with Alan Shepard. And so of the 12 men that walked on the moon, Edgar was number six. And he was an interesting guy, uh, and got to chat with him for a, for, for a few minutes. So it's amazing how your childhood happenings, the things that, 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 that impact your childhood can resonate later in life. And so for me, it was growing up with the space program. It was being lucky enough to have, having uh, gone down to watch Apollo 11, um, to going back and visiting and being on that tower where all the rocket engines for Apollo 11 and all the other Apollo rockets were tested, uh, for meeting Edgar Mitchell for, 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 for doing all those things. It's just an amazing story. And I, I wanted to take this time away from crime fiction to say, thank you, NASA. Thank you, America. And thank you for all of this because the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11 is upcoming and it is truly one of humankind's milestones and should never be underestimated and should never be forgotten. Well, that's it for today, and thank you for indulging me in this little moment of personal personal history. Uh, I hope, like I said, you enjoyed it. I hope it gives you some insight into things, and uh, next time we'll get back to murder and mayhem, I promise. Until then, this has been D.P. Lyle. Thanks.